Is it possible to predict the unpredictable? Can 3D printed life-size organ models help to map out complex surgeries ahead of time? Is it possible? It already is right here. Mayo Clinic. You know where to go. When it comes to quality sleep, Ashley has you covered with top mattress brands at winning prices and with special financing options available. You can snooze now and pay later. Plus, your mattress purchase helps give the gift of better sleep to children in need and U.S. Special Operations Forces. Visit your local Ashley store or shop online today and make every snooze count. Financing is subject to credit approval. See store or ashley.com for details. Welcome to True Crime Garage. Wherever you are, whatever you're doing, thanks for listening. I'm your host, Nick, and co-hosting with me as always. Together, we are two guys that are driving the movement to stop global whining. Ladies and gentlemen, the captain. Yeah, don't make me turn this car around. It's good to be seen, and it's good to see you. Thanks for listening. Thanks for telling a friend. Today we are still sipping on this fantastic beer by Highland Brewing Company, High Pines. This is a tropical, fruit-forward double IPA with notes of papaya, mango, and a little pine. Getting high praise from the garage. Garage grade 4 out of 5 bottle caps. And let's give some high praise and cheers to our friends. First up, a big cheers to Mama Marsha in Nashville. And a big shout out to Shelly in St. Paul, Minnesota. Next up, a double cheers to Grace and Nicola in Santa Monica. And a big we like your jib to Jessica in Reed Spring, Missouri. And here's a shout to Rebecca, who says that she has a crush on the captain. Well, I wonder if it's Becky with the good hair. And last but certainly not least, Captain, we have Speedro in Salt Lake City, Utah. Everyone we mentioned, well, they helped us out with this week's beer fund for the old captain's beer run. Yeah, that's what I wear when I go to the beach. A speed drill. Say it with me, B W E Double R U N Beer Run. If you'd like to support the show and get something in return, check out our store page at truecrimegarage.com. And that is enough of the business. All right, everybody, gather around, grab a chair, grab a beer. Let's talk some true crime. Continuing on with our questions for Sheriff Tobe Lesenby in the Delphi murder investigation, we now reach the point where we are discussing what they are calling the communication portion of the question submitted to the good sheriff. The question here is the lack of communication on the part of your department and law enforcement is a significant concern for many individuals. The exception seems to be the families of the victims. Why do you think this is the case? Sheriff Lesenby says, I respectfully disagree with this statement. As I have said since the beginning, much of what we protect and keep close to the vest is preserved for the courtroom and trial. To release too much information would, in my opinion, potentially taint a jury before a trial even begins. And as most know, the double jeopardy clause exists in the U.S. Constitution, which means, in short, the prosecutor only has one chance at prosecuting this case. I feel as sheriff, I have been very open and accessible, at least to mainstream media, and answered most questions reasonably. Well, a couple things there. One, when they try this case, and they will one day, they're going to seek the death penalty, period. And that's even harder to get a conviction when you seek that. That's what they'll seek. That's what they'll get. Indiana will execute this murderer. 
the other reason that the public the public wants more information that doesn't mean that we deserve more information the people that do deserve more information is the family but again if you look at a lot of interviews from Kelsey it seems as if her grandparents have seen all the video footage listened to all the audio footage probably have seen more information than the public has been allowed to see. Yes. What I have been told by Kelsey specifically and what I've seen other family members say in interviews or on record is that yes, they have seen additional portions of the video and heard additional portions of the audio and there's nothing really on there is what, what they have said. What I find to be very interesting is Tobe Lesenby, his answers really very similar. Well, why haven't you released more of the video if you have it? He doesn't say we don't have more video or audio. He says there's nothing earth shattering on there that would tell John Q public, oh, now I know who did this. There's nothing that's going to move anybody in that way. And take this a step further here, Captain. I have heard in one interview where Lesenby said that there wasn't really any useful additional audio of bridge guy right in the recording well and they had one of the sheriffs on the down the hill documentary say it's not a super lengthy video that they have Mm -hmm. the general consensus seems to be what about two and a half minutes potentially of video and or audio yeah i think there's a bunch of different rumors there but i think the thing too for the public at first law enforcement releases one photo which is from a video and then they go hey let's let's add a little bit to that and then they give you a little bit more after a time period of nobody coming forward and saying a hundred percent for certainty that that's the guy and then they're able to lock up the guy with those pictures if there was a better image they would have released the better image correct Th- that's probably the best image that they have and i want to take this a step further here captain Another thing that has been said, so the most common questions that I see recycled time and time again to law enforcement is, why haven't you released additional audio and or video if it does in fact exist? And why have you not disclosed the cause of death, the manner of of death in this investigation? To hit on that second one, they have outwardly said, and I agree with this 100%, They say that the manner of death would not help anybody in the public, again, say, oh, I now know who did this. I now can submit a tip because I know how they were killed. Right. That has to be true. I I back that up 100%. Does the prosecutor rely on you to determine what information is given to the public, or does he make that decision independently? And here, Tobe Lesenby is going to point out that they are both elected officials. They are both held to a different set of rules. So they both act accordingly inside those set of rules. So he's saying, no, the prosecutor doesn't tell me what I can or cannot say. And no, I do not tell him what he can and cannot say. The next question is, there is a surging movement across the nation from professional investigators and others insisting the police release more details about the crime scene and the investigation, not to mention the entirety of, of the video and audio found on Libby's phone. Why are you not releasing information? They go on to reference text written by searchers on the scene are now on the internet for everyone to see. There is also dispatch audio from when the girls were found on the internet. Now, given these facts, how can you justify not releasing more information? He's going to give the same answer here as we've seen before. I respectfully disagree with this statement. He's trying to protect the integrity of their investigation, reminding that because of double jeopardy, the prosecutor has one shot at this thing. Question. The prosecutor fought in court not to release the 911 tapes of the Flora fire and won. He has publicly stated all release of information concerning the Delphi girls must go through him. All murders are unsolved for four plus years. National statistics state after one year that there is less than 5% chance of an arrest. 
Is Carroll County doing the right thing by guarding information after four years, or are they endangering other children due to the prosecutor's office lack of experience based on your professional experience gathering evidence? Again, he's going to respectfully disagree with this statement as well. They're not releasing more information for they don't want to potentially taint a jury before a trial even begins. I found one thing to be quite interesting and and rather clever and a bit sad. One of the mothers of of the victims said in the Down the Hill two-part special, she said, we all hear how bad and how difficult a case can be to solve after 48 hours has expired. Now we have this case and it's been 48 months. Yeah, we're between a rock and a hard place. And I don't think any of us thought we would be sitting here having the same conversation of who is Bridge Guy? Why do we not know what happened after 48 months? I don't know if you picked up on this, but lately in some of the interviews I've listened to and then with the documentary, it seems like they're they're 100% confident that this individual is is a local. Well, and I agree with that, it, but but it's a much longer answer than just that. They say, we believe he, he lives in Delphi or was from Delphi. He's, you know, a local or was local at one point or may work here. So there's something, there's a local aspect to this suspect. Mm-hmm. And it could be something where he grew up in the area. Maybe he lived there for the first 20 years of his life and he's not been there the last several years or however old he is, or yes, he is a local or he works there. I, I believe that to be true for many reasons. One, I think that one thing that's very telling is Kelsey. She's the sister of one of the victims and other family members of these two victims have said that there are people that live in Delphi that have never walked across that bridge. Mm Mm-hmm. There are people in Delphi that have never gone to those trails. There's people that don't even know that bridge exists. Correct. So, and I believe that that bridge was a big part of his strategy for, for cornering. Yeah, as a trap. I think we both believe that bridge was used as a trap. And I think, again, moving, look, there's two different theories. I think me and you have, we butt heads a little bit on this. I think you believe that... The individual was parked possibly at the cemetery and that he was leading them to the cemetery and maybe a struggle happened and he decided to, or or he got angry and decided to murder him there. I believe he moved him in that direction because he knew where Logan's house was and knew that in order to, you know, get them away from anybody that possibly could see him or them you would have to move them in that direction because if you move them in any other direction, well, one, you, you're not going to take them back over the bridge and you're not going to move them in any other direction because there's property there and houses there. Yeah. And one thing I think we can agree on for certain and where our theories kind of overlap is that all of those actions would be the same in both theory where you're, you're moving, you, you've used the bridge as a strategy to corner your victims, whoever they would be. And then you're moving your victim and or victims in a manner that you're going away from where you will be spotted, where you would run into some trouble. And so the bridge and all of that land private and otherwise on the other side of the bridge where the girls were killed was part of that strategy. And for it to be part of the strategy, this is knowledge that this man had prior to that day something he very likely thought about and considered when going about the business of that day. Moving on to the terrain portion of the questions, Captain. This question is, there are many residents of the county that have never been on the trails. Describe the terrain of where the girls were found. What is the most direct route out of the area they were found? How long of a walk from where they entered to where they were found. Um, His answer is very similar to one of the state parks. I'm guessing he's saying that's about how the the size of the place. A lot of hills, brush, trees, etc. 
directly south of the Morning Heights Cemetery, but on private property. I do not recall the specific distance. Okay, so that must be where they were found. That's his vague answer, is directly south of the Morning Heights Cemetery, but on private property. I do not recall the specific distance. Here's where you can go. From the, from the bridge entrance or exit, however, you, the end of the bridge. The to, south end of the high, high bridge is right, what it would be called. To the crime scene or, or where the bodies were found, that's less than a quarter mile away. From that, where the bodies were found, to the cemetery is roughly about a quarter mile away. And this next question follows along that same, the same thoughts that we're having and, and sharing right now are in step with what we've been talking about. Ron Logan has stated on news programs, the only way to get to the site, uh, I guess the, where the girls were found, the murder scene is over difficult terrain and private property. Given the difficulty getting to where the bodies were found, many believe the killer or killers were familiar with the area. Do you as a law enforcement officer, believe that as well. And his answer is very much so. It is part of the reason why we continually feel it is a, quote, local or someone who was very familiar with the area. Well, here's what I know for certain. I I feel this uh, 100% in my bones. This individual has their own entrance and exit to the bridge or to that park. Again, we differ on how they get there, but this area, that's how they enter and exit. Yes. If if a vehicle was used or was used in this crime, I have a whole different set of ideas. But one thing that is fascinating to me is if this person would have been able to arrive on scene by foot and leave the scene by foot, there again, you would have a whole lot less likelihood that there would be any other video from other sources on bridge guy. And that might explain why we don't have any other footage from anywhere else of bridge guy leaving the scene or arriving on the scene. I a hundred percent believe he arrived and exited it by foot. And I also believe that's why there's zero eyewitness with as many people were at the park with the distance he would have had to cover, go back through the actual entrance and exit of the park, that somebody would have saw this individual and this individual would have had to be covered in blood. That's what is proof to me that this individual showed up on foot and left on foot. Next question. Who organized the search teams on February 13th and February 14th? How were individuals divided into teams and how were the search areas determined? Answer, it was a combined effort involving a number of first responders, police, fire, EMS, and community volunteers, divided mainly by their association with various entities. Firefighters went with firefighters and so forth. And anybody that's listened to our show for a while will know from from cases that we've covered, specifically with missing persons cases, that a lot of the searches might be overseen by law enforcement or the sheriff's department, but the firefighters have a different skill set and a different set of techniques. And they're very good at search and rescue. That's what they do when your house is on fire. Right. Oftentimes we will see and have seen in many cases that we've covered that the fire department is usually a very big part in deciding the leadership of the search teams and the goals, you know, or, or how they're going to go about searching a particular area or where they do search. So that question and answer makes a lot of sense. What is not question, and I failed to put it on my questions, but it's one thing that I asked Kelsey when I spoke with her, and it's something that I've asked anybody that's gotten close to this case, that's talked to the people in charge, and I said, did they require any kind of identification by the people that showed up to search on the 14th? Did you take records of any of those people? Did you write down their names, their addresses, their phone number? Did you, did you ask for identification before they signed up to search? How organized was it? And we know from, other serial cases, these guys return to the area. We talked about Amy Mahalovic's case. 
there's a guy that's a suspect right now because they believe that they saw his vehicle the day that her body was found months later after the abduction. They believe they saw his vehicle passing through a four-way stop near the body recovery site. And he had no reason to be there whatsoever. Right. So that puts him on a whole different list of prioritized suspects. And here, I would not be shocked if Bridge Guy returned to the scene to assist in the search efforts on the 14th. Well, if no. he was, in fact, that relaxed, mm-hmm. if, he, if, if, if we can dump him in the category of any of these other monsters that we've discussed on this show... It would not shock me. It would not surprise me if, in fact, he ended up on a search team on the 14th. Well, and what we've learned from other cases like Stephen Avery, that that crime scene or that location where they're looking for individuals was, you know, pretty contained and pretty small compared to a park. And there's several people that showed up to those searches that never signed in. And some of the people that were conducting the searches didn't sign in. I think, again, 100%, this individual was there on the 14th. They knew what they did. And they knew that by being there at the search that, hey, you, you, got, a, you got a piece of uh, clothing of mine or you got a, a cup with some DNA of mine on it. Well, I can argue that away that I was at the search. So, of course, you have an item from me that I left behind. The next two sets of questions will really be based around the command center and the county safety, the safety of the residents in the county, since it is an unsolved homicide case. And I love this round of questioning because this is really the checks and balances portion, the quality control portion. You got to check in with these officials. You know, how many people does Tobe Lesenby answer to? Not many is the answer. How many people does the prosecutor answer to? Not many. But at the end of the day, they're both elected officials. They answer to the community as a whole. So I love that we have this little bit of checks and balances. I loved seeing the mother of one of the victims say in her interview, you know, there are days that I feel like I should drive over to the the police department, the, the sheriff's department and say, okay, guys, what is it that we're doing today? What on our investigation are we working on today? Are we working on anything? Because it's been four years. So let's go through this quality control bit right here, Captain. The first question is, why is the investigative team, assuming there is one, still at the city building? Why was it ever at the city building? This is where they set up their command center. And his answer says, the main reason is space. The county does not have a facility, which adequately provides for what is needed for the investigation. Follow-up question. Who monitors and supervises the county investigators and how is that monitoring done? Are there written records of time spent on the investigation? He says, as sheriff, I am in charge of that responsibility, but also our county investigators are professional and experienced. I trust their abilities. We talk frequently a lot of times daily. Granted, there are days there's nothing new to discuss, and yes, records are kept. Next question. Is there still a team of investigators? How many comprise that team, and how often do they meet? And his answer is yes. Two county detectives, two Indiana State police detectives, and from time to time, outside detectives from other police agencies, including the FBI. A portion of the team meets almost daily, but with technology, meetings are not always in person. Obviously, with COVID, some meetings have been by Zoom. And this is a question I have for you, Captain. And I was wondering about this. We're looking at this investigation and going, okay, well, it's 48 months later. It's four years later. And a lot of people are going to judge the quality of the investigation based off of it's been this long and it's not solved. Should anybody out there be grading on a curve a little bit because because of COVID, because things have been shut down and because things have not been quote unquote normal for approximately a year now? No, I agree with it's you. it's a murder. It should be solved as soon as possible. And for all we know, they're doing everything in their power 
And all we can hope for is they're doing everything in their power to get it solved immediately. And just because other walks of life can't go and work as normal, I don't see how COVID or anything like that would have affected the investigation. It, it may have delayed things a touch, but but I don't see how it would really directly affect the the investigation. Well, the way I think it's going to affect the investigation mainly is that the individual, the local individual, is not going to be out amongst people. Mm-hmm. This individual, I believe, is nervous, nervous about being caught. If the killer is stuck in their house and isolated, then you're not going to have him slip up and say something that maybe makes somebody suspicious. Mm-hmm. Or you, he might not, he's not, might not be around the person where he's, he, Maybe he's telling his kids or telling somebody else's kids, hey, guys, let's go over here. And that's enough for somebody to go, wait a second, I've heard that voice before. So that's what it's doing. It's isolating the killer by himself. And there will be several follow-up questions to the questions we just went through as far as quality control and what's going on with the inner workings of the investigation. And I'll kind of sum up his answers there. Uh, He's basically saying, look, we have two county detectives that are working this case that this is their primary case that they work. We got two on the team from our agency. There's two from the Indiana State Police who oversees them. Well, obviously, I oversee my detectives. Indiana State Police oversee their detectives. They're asked, is there an FBI agent stationed at the command center daily? And the answer is no. And he says, but through technology, it's not difficult to communicate with the FBI. This is interesting. Is the command center secure? How many people have keys to the command center outside of yourself? The Indiana State Police, two county detectives and the FBI. Who has access to that room? And you can see why it's obvious why this is an important question. He says the the people that have access to that room is anyone that is tied closely to the investigation. Then a follow-up question of given the command center is out side of your jurisdiction, how do you as a sheriff assure residents their information is well guarded? And his answer is again, those closely tied to the investigation know what a top priority the case is and that the information is safe. This show is sponsored by BetterHelp. Do you look forward to the holidays? Maybe you struggle with seasonal blues. This time of year can be a lot, and it's natural to feel some sadness or even anxiety about it. But adding something new and positive to your life can counteract some of those feelings. Therapy can be a bright spot, something to look forward to, to make you feel grounded, and to give you the tools to manage everything going on. If you're thinking of starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online, designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. Just fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist and switch therapist at any time for no additional charge. Find your bright spot this season with BetterHelp. Visit BetterHelp.com slash garage today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash garage. Is it possible to predict the unpredictable? Could surgeons use a patient's own anatomy to create 3D printed life-size organ models to map out challenges ahead of time, making surgery more precise, efficient, and less invasive? Is it possible? It already is. Because every day we're doing what's never been done. Learn more at mayoclinic.org slash possible. Mayo Clinic. You know where to go. Rosetta Stone is the language learning program with a lasting impact. I've been using their app to learn French, and it's not just about memorizing words, but actually having real conversations. And it's not just French. They offer 25 languages. Right now, Rosetta Stone has an awesome holiday deal, 50% off their lifetime membership. Every language, unlimited access forever. For anyone keen on diving deep into a new language, check out rosettastone.com. It's a game changer.
All right, we're back. Cheers, mates. Cheers to you, Colonel. Cheers to you, Captain. Cheers to all the good people out there listening in their garages. Now, on to county safety, which has to be a concern. Anybody in the area that has a family trying to raise children, we have this double homicide that's still unsolved four years later. We have investigators telling us that we believe it's highly probable that the offender is local. He's somebody local that could yokel. Yeah. Local yokel. They could uh, go loco and go out and do this again. Yeah. Here's our question. Former Delphi police chief, Steve Mullen stated at the first press conference, quote, our people know what to do. End quote. After being asked if the community was in danger and what precautions should residents take parents of school aged children were taken aback by this statement. As the county's chief law enforcement officer, are residents, particularly young girls of Carroll County, in danger given the unsolved murders of six young girls? So anybody that's not familiar with the area, that area has had, in the past five years, there's been six young girls in two incidents murdered. And all of those cases are are unsolved to this day. Yeah. So his answer is comparing Carroll County to other jurisdictions in our annual statistics. I feel Carroll County is one of the safest areas to live in. I would much rather raise a family here than say a larger metropolitan area. I think it's a fair answer. I think it's a nice way of dancing around. Do you think this guy's going to kill again? That, that that that's really the question. And should parents be concerned? And I think this guy is scared. I think they know he's scared. I think he knows he's being watched and he knows that he slipped up a little bit and he hasn't been caught yet. So he's just going, I can't I can't slip up again. Well, and we kicked around the idea and everybody comes back to this. Is this a serial killer? Is this someone who's killed before? Or is this someone that will kill again? Is it a serial killer or do they have the makings mm-hmm. of being becoming a serial killer? And I think if in fact they do, if they do have the makings of becoming a serial killer, and this was the first quote unquote event in what would be a series, look, there's a cooling off period between murders for these guys. And maybe his image, his likeness, his voice being broadcast to everyone nationwide has made this cooling off period extensive. Maybe it's the rest of his life, but I, I feel like if, if this guy were going to act again, had that audio and the video not come out, right? I think he would have already run the cycle of kill, cool off, start hunting again and kill again. Mm Mm-hmm. And that's, again, where we have to applaud our two victims, our two brave little victims here, that while they were not able to escape this man, we have information on this guy that I believe has forced him to lie dormant and not act on urges that he very likely has. Yeah, I completely agree. The Carroll County and Delphi are small town USA. Yet there has been a significant number of violent deaths in the last four years, including the double murder on State Route 29, where victims, male and female, were shot and burned. A man was shot and killed near Deer Creek, and a Delphi police officer was recently found dead. For a county with under 20,000 people, that is two-plus murders per year, with the majority being female. According to national data, males make up 78% of all murder victims. It appears the opposite in Carroll County. Are females at a higher risk for violence in Carroll County? Mr. Lesenby says, in my professional opinion, I would say no. A lot of the situations, again, in my opinion, are coincidental. And here's a good question, Captain. They want to know, in the professional opinion of the sheriff, Would he describe the deaths of the six females? And again, we're talking about the Flora case with the four young victims and the Delphi case with two female victims. Would he describe these deaths as planned? 
And he goes on to say, no, rather victims of circumstance or opportunity. Additionally, Indiana State Police is the lead with the floor investigation. Our agency is not actively involved in that investigation. So to clear things up, he's basically stating the, the floor investigation, we don't have anything to do with. So right. you're asking me to give my professional expert opinion on something that I'm not involved in. Based off of that, we have to believe that his answer is in direct relation to the Delphi murders case. Exactly. Do you feel that these murders are planned, that these deaths are planned? And he says, no, rather victims of circumstance or opportunity. It's a very interesting answer. Well, I think that's that becomes a thing is we both believe the bridge was used as some for, form of trap. Like this individual would go to this park and go to these areas and and it's happenstance. If if a victim comes along, great. I'm not going to force it, but I have my trap. I have my idea of what I want to do. In that context, it's like, well, yeah, the whole idea was planned and maybe the whole idea was fantasized about, but the the individual never acted upon it because maybe he never had the opportune time. And then the question becomes, did this killer actually mean to kill them or was his intention something else and he lost control of the situation Mm -hmm. and lost control of himself? And look, if you're depending on your life and your livelihood by approaching these girls, maybe by taking control of them in some manner and maybe one attacks you or fights back or whatever. And you go, well, if they go to cops and they say, I was trying to sexually harass them or offer them money for sexual favors and they turn me in, my life is over. I think that becomes a question. Did this killer mean to kill them or was he reacting to their reaction to whatever he was trying or attempting to do? Right. And that's fascinating. What I think is very interesting though, that the overlaps again, where our theories overlap and, and our strong feelings about the case overlap is again, all centralized on the bridge itself, that the bridge was part of this man's planned strategy. Now he says these are victims of circumstance or opportunity. So then that means if I'm using this bridge to my benefit, to my advantage over my would be victim or victims, then I'm either waiting and sitting, lying in wait, waiting and watching, looking for a potential victim. And they present themselves. They come to the area by themselves And then I strike, or if I'm going to use the bridge, I have to lure my victim here. If it's somebody that I planned or picked out, I have to get them to this area. So it's, it's very interesting. I keep going back to the bridge because I think it's such a centralized part of this case and, and really a big reason why things went down where and how that they did that day in February. Yeah, I think some of this is similar to like a Ted Bundy or Jeffrey Dahmer where they go around their neighborhood looking in windows, fantasizing about killing. And I think this individual did the same thing with that park. But like I said, I believe this individual has their own entrance and exit. So sometimes people didn't even know that he was there. This next question is a judge has now stepped down for personal indiscretions with a prostitute. The prostitute stated the judge tracked her via the court system. The same judge jailed Mr. Logan. This would be Ron Logan, who people familiar with the case will know. His property is right near where the the girls were found. This same judge jailed Mr. Logan for probation violations shortly after the killings and called him a danger to the community. Now, four years later, the judge has resigned. The prosecutor has resigned and no killer is behind bars. Conversely, Mr. Logan has been cooperative with law enforcement. He was visibly shaken by the bodies being on his property, and he openly allowed law enforcement and media on his property. In your professional opinion, was Mr. Logan targeted by the prosecutor or law enforcement and or judge? And our answer is no. It may have appeared to be that way, 
but a lot of it dealt with timing on the part of the court system and when Mr. Logan's case was handled. Look, that may be true, and I have no reason at all to not agree or to not believe what the sheriff is saying. And in fact, I applaud the sheriff for taking the time to answer these questions. I think that he wants to be potentially even more transparent than, than they have. And I think because you have multiple agencies working together that maybe he's not said as much as he would like to put out there, but he's being a team player. So I have no reason to not believe Mr. Lazenby, but I get what he's saying that it was just kind of coincidental on the timing of everything that they were working with, with Mr. Ron Logan. But at the same time, I don't think that any of this stuff would have been amplified or, or magnified about Ron Logan's actions that day until the, because this all came about because those bodies were found. And of course he needs to be looked at. They're found on his property. Then they very quickly figure out, well, he violated some, some of his uh, probation rules right on this day. You know, he, he, he was, uh, he drove to the dump, which does not appear. I don't know if that was part of his parole violation, but he's not to be drinking and driving. And he was at a bar either the night before or the, or the day that they were found, or I'm sorry, the day that they went missing. More importantly, he was at a bar and that's a big no, no for Mr. Logan. And they did, they went after him pretty hard for all of that. So I think that in this situation, Captain Sheriff Lazenby can only answer for his actions where he's being asked a question that involves a judge and a prosecutor as well. And what went down with Ron Logan might be more of their actions than the sheriff's. Well, again, another example of this is you put out these sketches and people are going, Hey, there's a sex offender in that area that kind of looks like this sketch, check him out. And then they go and find out that the sex offender is not living where they're registered to be. at. Mm -hmm. Arrests will be made and the people will have to be punished for that. It's just kind of, you know, it's, it's just what happens. And, And I think in this case, there's probably been a bunch of people that had nothing to do with this crime, but now are locked up or charges were brought against them because they weren't doing what they were supposed to do with their life. The next question is how many total tips have been received? How many this year? How many this month? And his answer is going to be vague, but I think we can put in our own little work here and figure this out. He says total throughout the investigation is approximately 50,000. Total throughout this investigation is approximately 50,000. So he's not giving an answer on how many tips have been submitted this year or this month? He's just giving a total number for the four years altogether. I believe that it was in February or March of 2020 that it was reported that they had received 43,000 tips, roughly 43,000 tips at that time. So you do the math, get out the old abacus, count it up on your fingers and toes. It would appear that 7,000 roughly would be in the last year, the last 365 days. So that's still a good amount of tips. If, if my math is in fact, correct there, Captain. Yeah. It's because this community wants to see this case solved. When a tip comes in, take us through the step-by-step process of how that tip is processed by the tip line operator to how it is distributed to the investigators. Please describe what tipsters are told and the follow-up. And his answer is tips which come into the system are entered into a database. Each tip is then reviewed by investigators and prioritized. Email tips receive an automated response. If investigators need additional information from a tipster, they contact that individual directly. This is something we've talked about before plenty of times on the show. I've had people complain to me directly about other cases not Delphi specifically, but other cases where they say, I've submitted a tip to law enforcement. That was a year ago. I've never heard back from them. That's not their job. They're not going to get back to you and say, all right, uh, Colonel, this is what we did with your tip, buddy. Yeah, you don't submit a tip and then become 
a visor <laughs> right. on on the case. Hey, I submitted a tip, so now do I get a B on the grand jury? No, it does, doesn't work that way. Now, of course, there are agencies that are lazy, and then there are other agencies that just do their due diligence and go above and beyond and work their butts off and get, get things solved. But nine times out of ten, if not even greater percentage than that, you're not getting a call back or any type of follow-up unless they need more information from you. Right. Normally, whatever you give them, if it's substantial, they'll be able to confirm or deny your request pretty quickly. That's correct. What I wish they would work harder on is, like we've said, the step in the right direction. You, You can't sit there and tell me that the profile is too close to the chest where you can't share the profile. I think that's what we should do. We should get behind first our movement of stop global whining, but also specific to this case, let's well and stop and stop sniffing butts. Let's amp up this idea of hey, if you got a profile, which they should. I mean, they they've worked on this case for four years. If you've got a profile, let's release that to the public. Let's put that out there. I, I think it's well overdue for that fact. Next question, you stated in last week's article that additional audio recording on Libby's cell phone would not be released, but it has been stated by the HLN interviewer that, in fact, an additional two minutes of recording was shared with the family. How can you justify this? Okay, so what they're referencing here, you stated in last week's article, they received so many questions that were sent into the Carroll County comment for... Sheriff Lazenby, that they actually had to run it back to back weeks because they had so many questions. They gave them to the sheriff and he said, you know what? I'll open this up to a second round of, of questions. This goes back to exactly what we were talking about before. We all know that there's additional audio. We know that from what the family members have said throughout this whole four years. It's just, it doesn't appear that any of that is of of any value to finding bridge guy. Somebody cleaned up the audio. Maybe it was the FBI. Maybe they had to have a local technician do it. They probably heard the extra audio. I don't think there's any monumental thing that we're going to learn from the extra audio. We're going to learn more from a profile being released than anything. And I really, I'm going to keep harping on this, but I think they should have released it because every profile I've seen from ex-FBI or or other individuals in, involved in this case, as far as like when they're being interviewed and they go, well, I think the individual is this or blah, blah, blah. If you put all that together, there's a profile. And we would have learned, like I said, so much more from that profile than maybe even the sketch. Mm-hmm. And I think they believe that this individual is not a criminal, has not been in the system. And that's why... Look, everybody, any, like I said, anytime there was a murder that took place or or there was a registered sex offender or a rapist or whoever, the whole true crime world went, oh, that must be Bridge Guy. Mm-hmm. And so I think we've all been looking for a criminal the whole time, and I don't think this individual is. Or he's someone that has the ability to commit crimes and go undetected. Well, I mean, here's just a couple of things that I gathered from these interviews crime was sexual is about power and control this individual was calm maybe so calm that they're like a sociopath he's local the bridge was a trap he is normal he's not threatening he probably has a good job probably makes more money than the average individual in delphi he's probably married has kids btk killer like Mm -hmm. i mean that's that's a lot of stuff. And or Golden State Killer. I mean, you can the list goes on and on and on of these these monsters that are able to live in different compartments, live double lives. Right. And go undetected and may even be seen as an upstanding citizen in the community. Oh yeah, that's a couple other things. Uh this individual is somebody that nobody would believe is capable of a crime like this. This individual is connected to a church similar to like BTK. 
Well, along those same lines, Captain, here we are again, right in step with the, the questions that were provided and the answers that Sheriff Lesenby gave to those questions. It says, does a database exist that contains Carroll County violent crime data? If so, how can the public access this? This goes to the idea that this would be some guy that is out committing crimes and we're aware that he's doing them, that he's on a list somewhere in a database. And Sheriff Lesenby's answer is obviously we have extensive records of each jail booking, which reflect each individual's particular arrest violation. It can be publicly accessed, but the request must be specific to a person or their alleged arrest violation slash crime. Meaning you can't just get on there and go, I'm looking for somebody who did something despicable out in the woods somewhere. And then you get a boom, a list of people and you can go, well, bridge guy might be on this list somewhere. No, you need to be researching and looking up a specific person and, or their alleged arrest violation and crime. What sorts of information do investigators continue to look at for this case? I love this answer. It's very vague, but I think it's on point. His answer is several aspects specifically associated with February 13th, 2017. Meaning that day is by far the most important day to these investigators that know so much more than we do. Right than any other day as far as they're concerned. That means the day that the bodies were found, the day before when they went missing is more important. The day that so-and-so was arrested four counties over for a sexual homicide. No, February 13th, 2017 is more important than that day. More important than any day and any other suspect that came about via the public or the internet. They know that the one piece, remember, they're still looking for that one piece. They say, we will know what that one piece is. We'll be able to identify it as soon as it's presented to us or we, we find it ourselves. They know that the one piece they're looking for is going to be some information that is based off of something that happened on February 13th, 2017. Yeah. It could be something as small as putting a certain person in a certain area at a certain time. Yeah, and maybe what they're getting at with that is, does this person have some kind of alibi that they don't believe is a good alibi? Correct. Is this someone that was traveling on that day? The thing that's that's very interesting, and one thing that we have to remind ourselves, it's very easy to, to get very confused and to get torn apart by all this different stuff going on, the minutia of this case, of things that, that have been presented that probably have nothing to do with the solution to this investigation. Right. You got to look at the very bare bones of it and remind yourself of one simple fact. Okay. We know that the Snapchat picture of the girls going across the bridge was posted a little after 2 PM that day. And then we have law enforcement on record stating that we have strong reason to believe or almost at times talking about it like it's a fact that everything was over with said and done at 3.30 p.m. So we know this dude, bridge guy, was unaccounted for for that hour and a half. Two o'clock to 3.30. Where was he? If you got somebody that you suspect and he wasn't at work at that time, I don't care if he got off work at 145. I don't care if you saw him at 315 and he was clean as a whistle. This guy was unaccounted for for that hour and a half. We know that to be fact. And I think that's really what they're honing in on. And in a roundabout way, maybe reminding the public of that as well. Yeah, the colonel getting heated up. Next question. Do the investigators follow tips from social media? This is interesting. One person, a Sean Harmon, posted that his father and son were connected to the homicides. And I got to be fully honest here, Captain. Right. I don't know who Sean Harmon is, but he's he's listed in this article here. Yeah, he's a guy that came forward and said, hey, my, I believe my father and my son had something to do with this. And if you look at his father, he looks like bridge guy number one. 
the first sketch. His son looks like bridge guy number two. The second sketch. Yeah, and and his I believe his son was a part of the military for a while. So it's a weird thing to try to throw your dad and your son under the bus at the same time. And then you're named publicly as having done that. Yeah. And so what they want to know, was this tip investigated fully? And Sheriff Lesenby says the simple response is yes. Information which is felt to be legitimate to the investigation is followed into. This is not the arena for speaking to a particular inquiry or tip. But he's saying, look, if we find something on social media that we find of interest to the case, we'll investigate it. If something's presented to us that came from social media that we think is important to the investigation, we follow up on it. Makes sense. And then another follow-up question to what we're really pounding on the desk for, is there a profile of the killer or killers? And his answer is it has been discussed with experts. So again, I think we just need to echo the idea of it's time to, to really strongly consider releasing that profile to the public. Now, Sheriff Lesenby, again, I want to applaud him for taking up his valuable time to answer the questions of the community. I think it it shows his dedication to the investigation and shows his dedication to the, the community that he serves and to the community that his department serves. He does offer up a final comment. It says, it has been intriguing and thought-provoking to be able to engage in these presented questions the past two weeks. I realize not all agree with my responses. However, I have received responses of the affirmative aspect, too. As sheriff, the utmost importance, in my opinion, is the integrity of the investigation. The only way we will resolve to gain justice for Abby and Libby, for their respective families, and our caring community is is to remain dedicated to the preservation of said integrity. I believe we wholeheartedly owe that to these two wonderful young ladies. All right, Colonel. Or should I call you Billy? Billy Goat. What are your thoughts on this case four years later? I'm losing optimism. And I've done this in other cases as well. And it doesn't take me much to get back on board. But I'm losing optimism. I understand that tips have still come in. I estimate 7,000 in the last 365 days. I question the quality of those tips. We have 50,000 overall in the investigation. I think there's probably a lot of fluff in there that, unfortunately, investigators have had to sift through. I do not say that to try to deter anybody from reaching out to law enforcement or providing a tip. I want to be clear about that. I'm, I'm standing at the top of the mountain and shouting it as loud as I can. If you see something, say something, if you know something, tell law enforcement, because I do believe 100% they are in fact, just that one piece away. I did like hearing the sheriff say, look, that one piece, what is it? Well, our trained experts right. will know it, it's not something that will, that will go, be lost on us in the moment. This is something that we will know right away. I also believe what I've said for the past year, year and a half, maybe even two years. I had said at one point that I was very optimistic, believing that the case would have been solved by the end of that year. And I, I believe I said that in 2020. But I'm losing optimism in that way, and a large part of it is going back to something I've said all along. I believe, for whatever reason, Bridge Guy had help that day or since then, and this has been a huge speed bump in the case. It may have even sent detectives and investigators looking elsewhere. I think that someone is either willingly or unknowingly providing some type of false alibi for bridge guy and his whereabouts between I would say noon and 5 PM. If you got a guy that you suspect or you think is capable of this, let's underline that capable of this because there's very few people capable of something like this. If you don't know where he was between noon and five, 
and he's he's local or has reason to have been in the Delphi area on February 13th. Right. Give that name to law enforcement. That's how they're going to find their answer. What about what are your thoughts? 4 years later. I think you're exactly right. I have somebody that I think is a suspect. I think their wife is their alibi. I think she's lied about the alibi. I think she has pieces of information that prove possibly where they were to prove their alibi. I think that's what's holding up law enforcement. I think she's lying about that. I think it's easily provable that she is lying about it. I believe that she has stated to people that so glad we have an alibi so we don't become suspects. I believe this is an individual that has a... Which is a bizarre thing to say. Normal people don't say, I'm glad that we have a timeline of our whereabouts so we're not suspects. And the fact of the matter is, I know that she's lying. I have confirmation that she's lying about your guys' whereabouts. I think this individual makes good money. Nobody would expect that he would do this. He's connected to his church. He has kids, possibly grandkids. I think he's older than what they're claiming the suspect is in the drawing. I think they said 17 to 40. I think he was older. I think he was late 40s, but such a young face that he could look probably late 30s. And I think he's local. He entered on foot, exit on foot. He knows the area. He knows all all the properties around there. That's the direction he goes to enter the park. He uses that bridge when he enters the park. And I think he was able to get to a place of safety without being detected, being covered in blood, and to be able to get to a facility where he could get rid of all the evidence, all his clothes. I think, again, he makes more money than the average person in Delphi. His house is worth anywhere from five to six times more than the average house, average property in Delphi. Again, I think this is an individual that nobody around him thinks he's even capable of this. But I think this is about, it's a crime of sexual nature, power, control. He remained calm. I think this individual is very smart. He's very intelligent beyond college, graduate school. Again, leader of a company. This is his second career. Already had a career. This is his second career. I believe maybe there's somebody in his circle that suspects him. And if you do, call, pick up the phone and just say, look, I I know this guy and and I, I suspect him. I also believe that this person claimed at one point that they're going to leave the area due to it not being safe. And maybe they've even lied about selling property or leaving the area. And anyone out there scratching their heads right now going, well, how would this person be respected in the community? How would this guy not be known? How, how do we not know the people that know this man the best? How do they not suspect him? Well, keep in mind, Dennis Rader, BTK volunteered at his church for years. And he used the church's property to carry out at least one of his murders. Nobody in the church knew this guy was capable of doing what he did, what we now know for fact that Dennis Rader did, and he did it time and time again. In this case, in Delphi, the one thing that I am most confident about and what can be, what puts this monster into a different category than someone that just goes out and commits a crime of passion or some dumb criminal that does a crime on impulse Mm -hmm. is I think a big reason why he seems so calm on that day. So relaxed. And you almost hear it in his tone is because he has fantasized about aspects of this crime for years. He's thought about it for years and he was acting on those fantasies when he went out there on February 13th. I would not be surprised if he was acting on those same fantasies 
at an earlier date while he sat there watching and waiting, looking for what he would determine to be the perfect victim. And for whatever reason, he acted on February 13th. But the one thing we, we do know that he has not done is he has not since told somebody else, I'm the one that killed those two girls. I'm the bridge guy. If he has told someone else, the person that has received that information from this guy has such a little heart and such a little soul or maybe no soul at all that they've not reported that to anyone. I think this individual, when they released the new drawing, the new sketch that they eased up a little bit and went, they're further away from me than I think they are. But look, the stampede is coming. Your flood is coming. And they're not going to let you onto Noah's Ark. They're going to catch you. And you'll probably crumble like a baby and tell them anything and everything they want to know to try to spare your own life. What you deserve is death. That's what you deserve. And your flood is coming, my friend. And I hope they don't even give you the option to take that off the table. I hope they're holding so much close to their chest and not telling the public because when they get you, this is personal to them now. And your day is coming. Your flood is coming. If you need more True Crime Garage, all of our episodes are available now everywhere. Apple Podcasts, Spotify, wherever you listen to podcasts. And check out our bonus show, Off the Record. That's only on Stitcher Premium. Sometimes we all need a break from reality, so this is perfect. On this week's recommended reading, we picked a book that was released just this week, recommending a novel called Every Last Fear by Alex Finley. In Every Last Fear, an NYU student returns to his dorm only to receive devastating news that nearly his entire family has been found dead. The police say it was an accident, but the FBI seem far less certain, but won't tell him why. Check out Every Last Fear by Alex Finley, and you don't have to write that title down right now because I know that you're busy. Just go to truecrimegarage.com and check out our recommended page, and that's enough for this week, but we recommend that you join us back here in the garage next week. So until then, be good, be kind, and don't litter. Is it possible to predict the unpredictable? Can 3D printed life-size organ models help to map out complex surgeries ahead of time? Is it possible? It already is right here. Mayo Clinic. You know where to go.